coming to this event. This is the first Scholar Share event of the year. So for those of you who are unfamiliar with the event, it was formerly known as Books and Bagels, and it's an event that's co-sponsored by the Graduate Student Association and the Graduate College. So essentially every month, two uh, graduate students will give talks about their research. The talk should be about 10 to 12 minutes long, and they should be accessible to a wide and diverse uh, audience. So if you're interested in participating in the event and giving a talk, please go to our website, you Google Drexel Scholar Share. There's an interest form at the bottom of our page, um, and you can give one of these talks as well. Um, so our moderator today is Dr. Gail Rosen from Electrical Engineering, and she's going to be introducing our two speakers. Uh, right before she does that, I just want to note that right after this is the tax reform plan Q&A session, so please stay for that. Um, it's going to be a good event. Thank you. So um, the first speaker is Jen Chao Chao, and he is uh, speaking about machine learning in evolving domains. And so basically, his work is how do we keep up with the large amount of a uh, large volume of data coming in that computation can't keep up with? In some fields, such as genomics and in publication data, you can't keep up with all this data. So how can you learn it as it's coming in, as well as learning novel classes? So for example, there may be a new author that starts to publish. Can you now infer that this new author is publishing when you haven't seen examples of this author's publications before? So this is the type of work that Chen Chao is working on. And so I'd like uh, for him to talk to you more. Thanks for the introduction. I'm Jin Xiao Zhao. I'm a PhD candidate from uh, Electrical and Computer Engineering Department. And my advisor is Dr. Gail Rosen. And uh, yeah, so our lab is called e EC. So what we do is we uh, do bioinformatics, try trying to help uh, people understand more about the environmental process and uh, you know, uh, ecologists and uh, you know, things like that. And uh, so this topic would be machine learning in an evolving domain. So I'm going to give a general uh, idea about uh, what you know, the significance of AI is, in my opinion, and uh, how a neuron works and uh, my research interests. So there's an interesting comparison that they compare AI, artificial uh, intelligence, to electrification. So basically, the electrification is uh, considered as the most important engineering achievement of the 20th century. And uh, this kind of thing eased the physical workload a lot for a human. Because of it, people can start to doing things uh, uh, like you know, developing the uh, lightning uh, equipment and also some other equipment that, that can uh, help people uh, you know, generate more power to you know, uh, make products and also <coughs> help people lead a better life. And uh, the cognification uh, is another transformation that is happening uh, nowadays. And this is important because it's just like electrification. Cognification is turning everything to an AI. So basically, it can ease our you know, workload in mental domain. Basically, we don't need to think too much because AI can take care of it for you. And this is considered as the fourth industrial revolution, maybe. Uh, take a washing machine as an example. So based on electrification, we, can, we invented the washing machine that we don't, we don't need to wash our clothes ourselves. Basically, a machine can do it for you. But the thing is that we still need to remember to do the laundry. Basically, you need to collect all the clothes to need, you need to wash and put them in the machine and push the button. But maybe in the future, with the help of the cognification, we will have a robotic that do it for us. Basically, it will classify the clothes into need to uh, wash and not need to wash, and then put those need to wash into a machine and wash it for you. So based on that, you will basically forget there is a thing that called doing laundry. So that is really helpful, and if you think about that, it's really exciting. Not only that, not only it can ease our mental load, it can also give us more, uh, help us to get more deep understanding of the world. So take AlphaGo as an example. So basically this 
this game, Go, this game is considered as the, one of the hardest game that a computer can ever beat a human. But uh, the, with the help of the deep neural networks, the computer, AlphaGo, can basically beat many you know, significant uh, achieved uh, Go players. Uh, why is that? So when I was young, I used to learn a little bit about Go, and I was told that you should take over you know, the corner side at first, because if you think about it, you only need to worry about the attack from two directions in this uh, certain area. But if you want to uh, think about taking over of this center place, it's really hard because you, need, you are subject to the attack from everywhere. So that is the problem. And the people tend to solve this problem by first uh, taking over the corner and then taking over the edge because that is uh, the next easy problem and then tackle this hard problem. But, uh, you know, AlphaGo thinks this differently. <coughs> they think that uh, they can process the whole space in, a, in one time and this basically is faster than human and they process more information than human. So basically that is the human's limitation to think about this complicated problem, but that is actually the human's strength. And currently, many Go players are learning from the AlphaGo strategy, and they claim that AlphaGo is basically helping people learn more about our, uh, this Go game. So Go has been invented for like more than 2,000 years, but for now, with the help of AI, we are kind of really trying to understand this game again. So why is this AI, this deep neural network, is so powerful? So let's take a simple neuron as an example. So let's say we want to separate two different types of data. So one is from blue class and one is from red class. So a simple neuron can do is it can draw a straight line to separate this data. But at, as you can see, the red nodes are misclassified into the blue class because you will say, okay, most of the left side are blue and the most of the red side points are from uh, red class. So that's how you do classification uh, with a neuron. But there is some error. And uh, we have an algorithm called error backpropagation that basically backpropagates the misclassified data and tells the neuron to update the weights. So the weights here refers to the position of this line and the slope of this line. So basically, we want to move the line a little bit and kind of rotate it a little bit to accommodate this misclassified point. And we keep doing it until we are satisfied about the result. So this is a really simple neuron. And it can achieve basically a easier problem. But you know the black line here called decision boundary. So the decision boundary a simple neuron can give is only you know, a straight line. But with a stack of neurons, if we stack in the neurons together, what we can achieve? So here is the example that uh, you know, at the right side of the screen, you see the data. We have two different data. One is from the orange class, and one is from the blue class. And uh, this, is, this type of data is really hard to be classified by using a single street line. So we can concatenate those uh, simple neurons together and as you can see, it basically creates these uh, circular decision boundaries for us. And what it does is, uh, you can look at here. Here is the decision boundary of each individual neuron. It's still really simple. It's just some uh, you know, straight lines. But when you combine them together, it starts to achieve more and more complex decision boundaries. And it can split the data well. So given the AI, the artificial neural networks are so powerful, what is the limitation of this kind of uh, framework or model? So one of the interesting uh, limitations I'm working on is how does this thing dealing with you know, involving domain data? So basically, what if we have streaming data? So let's say we already trained this model based on these two classes. And some new, uh, new data comes over, and it met from one of the existing class, or it met from a new class. For example, we have some data over here that are from a third class that we have never seen before. The neural network doesn't know. 
For human, this is a really easy problem because you can basically draw another line over here to split the space into three different uh, subspace. But for neural network, it doesn't have this uh, ability right now. So what you need to do is you need to start from the beginning, collect all the data, put them into a matrix, and fed them into a new artificial neural network, and then ask them to train over and over again until it converts. But the problem is that we already have, in the previous model, we already have some information about the distribution of the data. Basically, we already know that if these two kind of data can be split by this word, a straight line. How can we integrate the existing model and the new data and try to hopefully get in a good result without reprocess and rebuild our model? So that is the problem I'm trying to tackle. And uh, I want to give this uh, problem uh, context that I have been working for a year that is called name disambiguation. So our lab has partnered with a company called Clarivit Analytics, which is formerly a division of uh, Thomson Reuters. So what they did is they have a database called Web of Science, and they collect all the journal articles, publications, and uh, put it into this uh, database. So one of their major concerns is that you know, people tend to publish a lot of publications, and there are people who have the same name. So I searched my advisor's name uh, in Google Scholar search engine, and uh, this, this, this is some part of the result. As you can see, it gives me a whole bunch of papers, and uh, some of them contains the, you know, the, the same name as my advisor, and some are not. So how can we know Let's say I'm interested in only my advisor's publication. How do I know which paper is written by my advisor? Are they the same author? So if you think about it as a human, so you basically can look at the title. So my advisor is working on bioinformatics. So you can think, OK, so these are more related bioinformatics. But my advisor used to be a PhD student in signal processing domain. So maybe the second one is also a publication by my advisor. So as you can see, even for human to you know, process this kind of data and do name disambiguation <coughs> is a hard problem. And uh, they want to you know, build an AI that helps us to you know, classify these documentations into you know, the, the authors that re, uh, published them. So given this, this really hard problem, here's another challenge. That is, uh, the number of publications that's been added to this uh, Web of Science database is exponentially growing. So let's say you already have a good AI uh, model that can do the classification for you. But what if there are uh, some new data comes over and need, need to be added to this Web of Science database? What do you do? You have to reprocess the whole database, and it can take to up to two weeks but you know, every day people are publishing new publications. So this is kind of a lag of processing this kind of information. Can we come up with an idea that can first classify the existing data, and then whenever there's new publication comes over, we just add it to the existing database and do the disambiguation very quickly. That is what we want to achieve. So, with the incremental learning, when we have some new data, I'm not sure if you can see there's a, a green cluster here. So we already use the model that can split these two type of cluster. And when some new data added to it, with the incremental learning, we basically can draw a new line and split this uh, subspace and create a new data to uh, create a new class to accommodate for this new data. But without incremental learning, this new Part will be forced classified into one of the existing class, and this can be uh, causing errors and other problems. And uh, as I mentioned before, you know, retraining the whole, reprocess the whole data and retraining it again is computational expensive. And we want, it's just given a new existing model, we just want to update the existing model using the new data without reprocess the whole database. 
So here is a video that uh, uh, is kind of a similar uh, works uh, similar as what we want to do. It's called incremental clustering. So as you can see, we add uh, new data over the time, and we connect the data we think they are from the same cluster together. So the, the color of the data points are represents the ground truth. And the link here we created is what we, uh, it's kind of like our prediction. We think they are from the same class or same cluster. So, so this algorithm is basically can give you a sense of how incremental <coughs> learning is working. So basically we are adding many new data points and it's based on the existing clustering assignment and the new data, it can classify it quickly. And also when we have some brand new class coming over here, it can recognize this class quickly and create the new class to accommodate this data. So our solution to the author disambiguation um, problem has been accepted by an international IEEE conference. And uh, what we propose to do is uh, we first uh, take a traditional uh, author name disambiguation framework. And then we use them to generate <coughs> pseudo labels and we use these labels to train a naive base classifier. When new publications are available, we use this model to classify these new publications into one of the existing classes. When we have these classes, we then have a mechanism called uh, co-author similarity. So what this does is it compares the new data, the new publication author to the existing author we predict it's from. And we see how we can compute the similarity between these two. If the similarity is really low, meaning although we classify it into one of the existing class, but actually it's not. And it's time to create a new class for it. And then, based on that, we will update our model. So in this way, we don't have to reprocess all the existing data we have processed, and we just based on the existing model to uh, process the new data and uh, create new classes for the new data. And here are some other possible use cases. Uh, from a bioinformatics perspective, you know, we collect the DNA, we collect the samples from the environment, and then we extract, we extract the DNA sequence from that. And then we want to figure out who is there and uh, what can they do. So basically we want to say, given the DNA sequence, uh, which bacteria are they, and uh, what uh, function are they doing right now? So this is kind of a classification problem because we are trained on a lot of bacteria, and uh, we want to uh, say, given a query sequence, uh, which bacteria it is from. But this is an can be also regarded as a, a incremental learning problem because we keep finding new bacteria every day. So the training dataset is keep expanding, we cannot afford to retrain the classifier every time when we find a new bacteria. So how can we integrate the existing model and the new bacteria we found to get a better training data set and the incre like increase the performance of our model? So that is the problem I'm currently working on. So I would like to take this moment to thank my advisor, Dr. Rosen, and also I would like to thank the support from the company Clarit Analytics and the CVDI. It's a center for visualization and decision information, uh, informatics. So thanks for here. And, uh, I'm really so uh, any questions, or do we hold the question? Hold it, yeah. hold it to the end. Okay, so I guess we will hold, if you have any pressing questions, you'll be able to ask after the second talk. So, um, basically, uh, the second speaker is Yeokang <laughs> Fang, and she's um, a PhD candidate in information studies in the College of Computing. And so she's going to look at per personal health information management from activity trackers. So like Fitbits, that sort of thing. And um, how can you personally manage your health better? Thank you, Yanya. Hi, everyone. My name is Yanya Fen. I'm a PhD candidate at College of Computing and Informatics. So uh, today I'm here to present a recent study of mine 
uh, titled Personal Health Information Management from Activity Checklist. Okay, so first a little bit about my research area. So the broad term is human-centered computing. So uh, as the previous uh, presenters uh, study, important study on artificial intelligence and all of this new computing and informa information technologies, uh, there's an another side of the story is how we people interact with such technology. So I think that's a very good mixture here about what we study. So the first area of my study is human-computer interaction, which is also called HCI, which is a field of, I think it's within computer science, but look at the design of computing system. And specifically, we focus on the interaction between people, humans, and computing technology. And the second area of mine is human information behavior that describes and examines how people need, seek, manage, give, and use information in different contexts to achieve certain goals. So this is my research area. And I think uh, this graph is very important because uh, nowadays uh, for the uh, STEM field, the technology field, we focus on building technology, which is very important. <coughs> we have to build it so we can have all these uh, uh, like wonderful like, apps and devices that can help us with our life. However, uh, with all this emerging technology, we also need to think about this technology. What's the impact of the technology on us? So my uh, research area overall uh, considers uh, from the social and behavioral perspective to computing and information technology. I hope that explains my area. <laughs> okay, so here's an overview of this presentation. So I will briefly introduce this study with some related background. And this is a web survey study conducted here at Drexel, so which I think the data is from our community, which is maybe of, of interest to most of you. So one question, have anyone used one of these devices? Good, these are fitness trackers. What about these devices? I have one. These are smartwatches, which is more advanced uh, models of trackers. And anyone use this kind of devices? <laughs> yes, everyone has used it. So smartphones, I think most of the high-end models right now have the activity tracking function embedded in them. So all of these devices is called activity trackers. So it's a wearable device or computer application that records a person's daily physical activity. So if you wear one of these fitness bands, or if you bring your smartphone with you, it can record how many steps you take using the sensors embedded in those devices. So my research is looking at this type of emerging technology. So some background about activity trackers. So it has attracted high popularity among consumers. People are buying it like crazy. <laughs> However, the problem is, according to a business report, so more than half of the U.S. consumers gave up using their trackers. So this is a problem about adoption. So current user research on activity tracking devices focus on user adoption and persuasive technology. It's to give you the extra notifications to keep you motivated and it aims to keep people like using it in a longer time. However, uh, not much research has focused on how people actually interact with the information generated by the trackers and how they make sense and use of such information. So that's where my research come coming to. So I focus on personal health information management. And for this specific study, I focus on non-patient population. I call it healthy users, but it's more uh, about the general population. 
because if you want to research patients, it's another story in terms of uh, IRB. So. Okay, so related work, a few uh, theoretic concepts I use for this study. So, because I look at personal health information management, which is the information is part is of uh, personal information. So I use the theories from personal information management. So it's generally refers to how a person uh, acquire, create, store, organize, maintain, retrieve, use, and distribute information to achieve certain uh, goals, responsibilities, and fulfill <coughs> their roles. So. A brief explanation is that people engage in different activities to manage their information, to connect between needs and information. So sometimes we move from needs to information, that's we find information. If you want to find some information of graduate college, you would go to the Drexel website, type graduate college, and you get the information you want. So sometimes we move from information to needs, so for example, when you find an interesting article when you surf in the web, but you don't have time to read it, so maybe you bookmark it for later use. So that we keep the information to serve our future needs. And sometimes there's no specific directions. So these are called meta-level activities. It can be how you organize your information, for example, uh, if you are taking a course, you put all the slides, assignments, and all other information related to that course into a folder. That's a way you manage and make sense of the personal information you have. So I use this uh, conceptual framework to guide my research. So these are different types of activities we engage with our information. So uh, to look at how people manage the information from their trackers, I designed a web survey study to answer three research questions. So this is exploratory study, not hypothesis testing. So the survey is slightly different. So first one, I want to know what are active tracker users need. Second is what types of personal health information management practice they engage in. And finally, based on the first two research questions, I want to identify any gaps between uh, people's needs and their personal health information management. So that's where we get the design implication for future technology. How can we improve the accuracy tracking technology overall? So methods, I design a web survey. Uh, and the <coughs> questionnaire includes four sets of questions, I will go over it quickly. And as for recruitment, I use purposeful sampling and targeting at those who use an activity tracker. So in this case, I, I target at gym goers and who have used the tracker and self-identifying as healthy, so non-patient. So I find a partner gym, which everyone knows is our rec center, and I talk to the membership coordinator and she, happy, she was happy to help me to send the uh, invitation to the questionnaire to all the members via their listserv. So something else about that is Drexel University is very supportive to graduate students' research. So if you want help from any of our like, departments or other uh, university affiliate uh, organizations, you just need to ask. Uh, if there's no rules against it, I think they will help you. So thanks to Rec Center, I was able to get 170 valid responses. And so for the data analysis, I have both uh, closed-ended questions, like multiple choices, Likert scale, as well as open-ended questions where respondents can uh, put their comments. So, this is qualitative data that I do semantic analysis. Okay, some of the findings, interesting stuff. So for the respondents, most of them are female, and uh, I have uh, males 
and two respondents identify as other gender. And so the age distribution is most of them are in their 20s and 30s, but I also get uh, quite uh, some good representative in older age groups. Also the, their profession, most of them work in higher education, which is to be expected. And their gym visit, uh, actually they visit the gym very often, and I think more than two thirds of them visit the gym at least twice a week. And also about their physical activity, they do in the gym, it's a variety of exercise. So the activity tracker use, so this is very interesting. One third of the respond respondents, they use one tracker. And two thirds of them, they actually use more than uh, one tracker. That's at least two trackers. And also this is a type of tracks they use. It seems Fitbit is the most popular brand here. And I asked a question, do they still use any tracker? Surprisingly, 80% of the responses said they still use any tracker, which is very good. And only about 20% of the respondents said they tried but gave up. So the length of active tracker usage is very good, in my opinion. So current users, more than 75% of them use their tracker, a uh, tracker or maybe, maybe different trackers for more than one year. So this is a very different population than the general public. And I can really get the insights from the people who actually use the tracker and continue to use it to give us some implications. How can we design the technology to keep motivate people using that? So their findings, number one, needs their goals from gym visit, improve physical health, uh, healthy lifestyle, build muscles, lose weight, look good, all sorts of reasons and goals. And in, in relation to their needs, I find that for both past users and current users, they have a high level of unmetness. So for example, for past users, so this one uh, said that the tracker failed to capture important information that this respondent need. So, in many cases, if you go to a gym, if you are interested to uh, do like weightlifting exercise, uh, most likely an activity tracker uh, isn't able to capture the information you are interested in. Is uh, how 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 much weight you are lifting and how many times because. Uh, the sensors usually uh, most likely capture the distance, sometimes your heart rate, uh, but not so much about the weight you are lifting. And also there's a mismatch between their needs and motivation design. So most of the trackers right now is like uh, you have a daily step goal of 10,000 steps per day and it keeps you give you notification that, oh, you need to walk another 500 steps to reach your goal. But this is not a goal everybody has. So the mismatch between that uh, leads some respondents to give up using it. As for current users, they have unmet needs, but it's more like what improvement can we make. Uh, usually it's technology improvement and also motivation design. And also another interesting thing I find that using activity tracker usually serves as an overarching goal of people's health or fitness related goals. So their overarching needs is usually improve physical health or lead a healthy lifestyle. So for example, actually my respondent says uh, they use uh, app, an app called My Fitness Pal, if someone knows this app. So the primary function is that you can log what you eat and you can calculate the calories of each food you eat. So for these types of respondents, they use an activity tracker in addition to my fitness uh, pal. 
because because they want to take care of our, their overall health, including physical activity, as well as a balanced diet. So usually using a tracker is only part of their goal. And the findings on their personal health information management. So the apps used. So this is interesting too. Like uh, one third of the respondent use one app. That's usually the app that comes with the tracker. So if you use Fitbit, they probably they just use Fitbit app. So if you use uh, Apple, uh, like iPhone to track your steps, probably the app they use is Apple Health app. And however, about two thirds of the respondents they actually use more than one apps. That is two, and some use maybe six, seven, like a lot. And predicted future use of applications, and most of them will continue to use their app. Because it's low maintenance. And uh, however, uh, one fourth of the current users, they are open to try new apps. So this is a very interesting comment in my data, is I haven't found a really great third party app that has anything useful to my Fitbit app, but I'd like to be able to plot data easily. So uh, the findings here is that the uh, health or fitness apps serve as a primary tool for users to manage their personal health information, and it's kind of uh, like take over the finding and keeping activities for this specific type of personal information. However, the users also reported they have other types of information management practices which are very interesting. It's not even digital. So uh, 18 participants commented that they keep an exercise journal either on paper or on their laptop phones because the current uh, apps doesn't support that function that help them planning their exercise, their activities. And also five of them said they have downloaded raw data from the provider. Fitbit allows you to do that. So if you can download a CSV file to manipulate it by itself. So this is uh, a runner who's training for a run kind of keep a paper journal about uh, his or her run. That's the information important to him, him or her, but it's not integrated into the activity tracking <coughs> technology. So these are the macro level activities our technology should focus in future. So based on the first two research questions, I identified a few gaps that we may address in the near future. So first is unmet need versus limitation of technology and design. So this is a very interesting graph. My ideal tracker would be waterproof, would have an extensive inventory of food for calorie recording, would have a heart rate monitor and to be able to accurately record cycling would never need to be charged. <laughs> Yeah, if that's my ideal tracker too. <laughs> the second thing is uh, overarching need and information fragmentation. So for fragmentation is that your information is scattered among different apps. So you don't have one thing to manage all the information you need. So also uh, uh, comments about they want a track, uh, an application that can manage all their information. And also, this is personal control of privacy and security versus technology convenience. We usually keep in the, our privacy to the convenience we can get. So finally, a discussion and design implications for our future activity tracking technology, which is we need to address the unmet needs or the diverse needs of our users. However, we need to re recognize the limitation of our current technology. So technology cannot solve all the problems. We also need to look at the different motivation mechanisms of people who are trying to uh, do behavior change, 
to switch to a healthier lifestyle. And also in terms of design here, specific implication is that we should design for advanced needs, diverse needs. And also we need to consider different motivation mechanisms. So for people who want to get more steps or people who want to uh, run faster, there are very different uh, motivation we can manipulate a little bit to encourage them to uh, achieve their health-related goals. And finally, information fragmentation is how can we combine those information together to support their overarching goals. And finally, this is uh, a take message is that right now we need to focus on meta-level activities and we need more ways for users to make sense of their data. To, for them to actually use their data to plan their future physical activity. Okay, that's all of my presentation. Yes. So, um, so thank you very much, Yanyan. Um, I guess I would like to open up the floor for questions. Yeah, we only have a few minutes for those events after this, but we'll take like, two questions. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay, go ahead. Uh, how do you, yeah. How do you think your data would have been different if you used the gym in a completely different population? You know, there's mainly students here and faculty members, but if you went somewhere else in Philadelphia, you would have been Yes, yeah, so this is part of my study. Actually, the data I get, uh, only a small portion of them are students. Most of them are staff of the university or those who work in University City. And the second population I'm doing, I'm collecting data right now is through social media. There's a runners group on Facebook. So I've already collected the data. So for runners, they have different needs, different design. Uh, needs, so uh, I think that would be interesting to look at different populations. Thank you. Alright, so with that, let's thank the speakers one more time.
went well. Uh, I'm Elizabeth Van Lotsdale, I'm interim vice provost for graduate education, and I realize that there has been a lot of unsettled feelings and reaction to the uh, proposal uh, regarding tax reform. And so, in order to try to address some of your questions and also just increase awareness about Drexel's actions here and maybe to help uh, as a teachable moment for increasing advocacy at the local level, I've asked Brian Keach, who is um, our uh, Vice President for uh, Government and uh, community. community Affairs to join us and speak with you a little bit about the current state of where the bill is, um, and just some broad strokes, but then answer your questions just so that you all are aware that we're here to support you. We are following and monitoring the situation very closely, so I'll just turn it over to Brian. Thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Confused. Yeah, confused. You're not alone. So the sands are shifting quite a bit. Um, let me just go back a little bit, uh, a week or so, to when the House bill um, first came out. H.R. 1 uh, is the Tax uh, Cuts and Jobs Act, as it is known. It uh, was really done behind closed doors by the Republicans. So a lot of what they've been working on, as you've heard about tax reform over the past couple of months, uh, nobody knew exactly what was going to be in that bill, and then it became public. The House Ways and Means Committee, um, of which we had two members on from Pennsylvania, Pat Meehan in Delaware County, Mike Kelly in Erie, and then of course there's a host of other people from around the country. They're particularly important to us because we can impact them. We have relationships with them. We have students that come from their areas where people live in their districts. So we lobbied them uh, pretty hard, and you should know that that lobby effort includes just about every imaginable association at the national level that you can think of. So this is a huge, big, broad effort. Uh, when that bill came out, it was clear that higher education was going to be a serious target and victim of the loss of all these deductions that we'd be able to take under that piece of legislation. Unfortunately, through the amendment process and the markup, uh, Chairman Brady held a pretty tight rein on the markups and everything stayed in that bill. And as you know, yesterday, uh, there was a vote in which it was passed. Only 13 Republicans who are in moderate districts around the country uh, voted against the bill. It was 227 to 205. But there was an expectation that that was going to pass. Um, but all of the Democrats voted against that bill. At the same time, now the bill is uh, moving in the Senate. The Senate has a different version of the tax reform. And there are much better uh, outcomes for higher education in that particular bill than there are in the House bill. The key difference really is that both bills uh, have an excise tax on endowments. Drexel University is not affected by that. But I think philosophically, we would be opposed to taxing charitable contributions or the income investment that you receive from the endowments. Uh, an excise tax on nonprofit salaries of a million dollars, which would affect a lot of nonprofits and hospitals, doctors, President Fry was in the other day, and then uh, UBIT, which is a business income tax, which we already pay, <coughs> those taxes would go up. We're not going to fight those particular provisions because the Senate bill as it stands now without the other nine provisions that affect higher ed across the board is far better for us. Now there's a host of other taxes within that legislation that are outside of the higher education world that I'm not focused on. It's my job is just to focus on higher education. So related to things um, like health care, which is a component of the Senate bill, might help to disrupt that, but it may not pass as a result of those provisions. I mean, time will tell. Yesterday, the Senate was considering over 350 amendments to the bill. So let's talk about how confusing it is to try to follow that. You can imagine that each and every one of those amendments, when someone puts that forward, changes the financial formula of what um, the tax outcome could be. And one of the issues that the Senate is dealing with is they want to pass this bill with 
50 votes, which means that Vice President Pence would be the tiebreaker vote. So that's just a simple majority. But they can't do that if the bill increases the deficit more than 1.5 trillion over 10 years. It's related to something called the Burke Rule, um, you know, which would increase the deficit that they would need more bipartisan support from the Democrats. So they don't want to do that. They want to push this through. I don't know that that's going to be able to happen. You already really started to see some senators defect. Um, Senator Johnson yesterday from Wisconsin was added to the list of people who are already going to be against this who are Senate Republicans. Remember, there's only 52 senators, so they only need three people to defect to blow it up. That's what happened with the Affordable Health Care Bill, not once, but twice. So that could happen here, but I don't know that that would be the case. I mean, we'll see. I, I can't predict what's going to be in the final bill. If the Senate gets this out on the floor and they vote for it, then of course the Senate and the House are going to have a conference together, reconcile the differences between the two bills, and we're going to try to do that before the Christmas holiday. But we'll see what happens in the Senate. So we'll know over the course of the next couple of days through Thanksgiving, the week after Thanksgiving, how things are working. Just so you know, our lobby effort, President Fry has been heavily engaged with great relationships with a number of different people, including Senator Toomey. Uh, he wrote a letter to him last week. Uh, he'll be calling him. Um, we've got uh, all of the associations uh, involved in this. I talk to NICU on a regular basis, which is the National Association of Independent Colleges, um, the American Council on Education. I'm on the board of the Association of Independent Colleges and Universities in Pennsylvania. There's over 80 colleges and universities in the state. We have a lot to lose from the perspective of the higher ed and med sector. Um, and so there is pretty much an all hands on deck effort to try to convince um, our senator to keep any of those other provisions in the House bill from creeping back into the Senate bill and also keeping them out of Congress. <coughs> so uh, that's kind of where things are right now. Um, I'll stop and try to answer some of your questions. Again, this is you know, a major effort that hasn't occurred for over 31 years, and we haven't seen the likes of this kind of complicated tax code uh, try to be fixed for a long time. The Republicans are bent on getting some kind of tax reform done. There's a big campaign promise that they made, and they did the same thing with the Affordable Care Act, and they lost there twice. So they're feeling like they really have to get this done. Uh, but you see the defections by some of the moderate Republicans in the House because they're in those swing districts that if they made that tax vote, they will not likely win in the midterm elections next year. And I think that's probably what you're going to see with Costello, Fitzpatrick, and me and all in our surrounding counties here. They all voted for the bill so far. Now remember, they can change their vote going forward depending on what happens. Can you just take a minute to explain what the students might be able to do at the local level reaching out to their representatives? Yeah, so I mean the key, the key thing to do now is really focus on Senator Toomey. He's on the Finance Committee. He's one of the leading people writing this uh, piece of legislation. Um, you know, I can't tell for you what your own positions are on the whole tax bill, but from um, the perspective of, of students in, in higher education, the Senate version of the bill is far better than the House. So that's the bill that we'd like to see get through at this point. Um, but remember, there are a host of other uh, organizations and people that are affected by this piece of legislation across the board. Some are happy, some are not happy. Uh, if the House bill passes, uh, what's the university prepared to do to help the graduate students? Uh, we haven't gotten that far yet because we don't know what the implications are. The House bill did pass the House. Right. right. But, um, you know, we can't really answer that question until we know what's in the final version of the bill. And then we have to think about how are we impacted, how are our students impacted, um, and then go from there. But I, I really can't answer that question until I know what's in the final piece of legislation. I'm going to follow up on that. Is there any way to, regardless, I just specifically talk about the fact that tuition rates becomes taxable. Right. Yeah. Is there any way to address, is there any way to, to change the nature of that, or is that like, from a legal perspective to change that? Well, was... well if, 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 if you're, this affects me, for example, I have a daughter who's here now, 
um, and I get tuition remission on her um, you know, uh, tuition, and I don't pay taxes on those funds, I have to start paying taxes uh, on that. That doesn't affect the university as a whole. Right? So the university doesn't see the cost to that. They're already paying that. They're putting that tuition out on staff. The challenge there is that then it makes it more difficult for us to attract employees. Right? Yeah. Keep, 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 keep them. Yeah. 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 Keep them, attract them, give them additional benefits. I, I don't know what's going to happen there yet. Yeah. Um, but that, so there is the, the other, the cost. I think that there's not a financial cost. We already assume that cost, right? Because we provide those tuition benefits. But the cost would be in what does that do to us as an industry? How do we attract people? Some people make life decisions to be at an institution based on the benefits that they get at institutions of higher education. I want to. So, from my understanding, is if I, the worst case scenario right now, that would leave us all in the state of uncertainty, is if it passes in the Senate, which it is kind of likely to do. You're left with the discrepancy between the health bill and the Senate bill, right? So what can the university do to advocate in our behalf to make sure that those discrepancies that are solved wouldn't further hurt higher education? Well, we're working to make sure that they're not in the bill. I mean, we're lobbying. That's, that's the effort that every university across the country is currently engaged in. So uh, what more can we do is increase the advocacy effort, which is, I think, what Elizabeth was getting to, that you need to pick up the phone and call Senator Toomey's office. You need to explain to them what your point is. The more people they hear from, the better. And That's I what lobbying is. That's what I, mean, I, haven't had, is. I haven't had personal success in reaching to his office or something. Uh, a lot of people haven't. So if you have any advice for that, that would be yeah. really helpful. Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's important that you write a letter and you call yes. the office. Yes. And you, that you, write it, you let them know that how you're going to vote. Now, I know he's not up for re-election for a number of years. Um, yeah. But that's... That's part of what the lobby effort is. It's not easy. What about those of us who don't vote in the uh, That doesn't mean that you still can't weigh in um, with your elected officials. What I would do is, if you're from another state, get onto the um, Senate webpage, just click on the Finance Committee, look who's on that committee. If, if you live in their state, they're the ones that are currently marking up the legislation now. Let them know. Even if, you, even if they're not on the finance committee, uh, it's important because it's eventually going to come to the floor. Let them know where you stand and what your position is uh, and how you intend to vote uh, if they support the tax bill with damages to students or other things you might be concerned about. Um, just because I know a lot of uh, Drexel graduate students are also international students, is there any way that they can help try and make sure that? They're not heavily affected by this because they can't vote. So I mean, there's no real reason that the Congress will listen to them. But like, well, I think they still have good arguments to make. I mean, that's part of the arguments that institutions are making, right? The revenue generated from international students is in the neighborhood of forty some odd billion dollars a year, up significantly. Last <laughs> I looked at some of the statistics, uh, and those numbers have grown since 2004, 2005, from about ten million to over forty billion. So from the perspective of how important this is to the economy, um, those messages are critically important. Not to mention the fact that many people are international students, stay here, develop businesses here, uh, and uh, even if they don't, they go back to their home countries, they create a relationship with the United States from a diplomatic perspective, those kinds of things are good. So those are the types of arguments that you can make. Um, by the way, I would encourage you to look at some of the association websites like NICU, like ACE, they have a lot of good talking points and information about um, each of the different provisions that are in the bills that affect higher education and why they're important to our industry and why they're important to students. And I know from a graduate student perspective, having to pay taxes on some of the benefits that you receive would really be detrimental. I mean, people are already struggling um, with, with the finances that they have now, so having to pay taxes on those benefits would be really tough. Going back to um, going over that, or going back to the to the fact that tuition should be taxable, that could really be a lot of departments cut the funding in half. We could how would is the school in any way ready to address that? Um, we haven't started to talk though, about what we're going to do financially to deal with that because we don't know yet what the financial impact is going to be. We can sort of estimate it, 
but we also don't know what human behavior is either. So if you take, for example, employer benefits to students, so we have students that work for a particular company that come to Drexel for graduate education or online education, um, the employers continue to pay that benefit. Right? So now the individual who's receiving the benefit is going to have to pay taxes on it. But that may change the decision about where they go to school. They might choose less expensive options. They may choose not to invest in their own education at all, which will hurt the industry overall. Uh, a rough estimate for us would be like a $35 million hit if everybody decided not to come to Drexel University who's currently getting those benefits. That's not insignificant. That affects our overall revenue, and then it makes it difficult for us to offset other things. So the best case scenario for us is that the Senate passes without any of those provisions in the House and the bill. Anything that gets added back in, each one by themselves, is detrimental. All of them together are like a tsunami. So it would be a very significant challenge for the university to address all those issues. So I know some uh, people have pressure hard for this Sciences. We're noticing that a lot of people, the Senate the Republicans, that are going to say no to the bill aren't saying no to the bill because higher education. They're saying no to the bill because property taxes, because it works, uh, take us up, and stuff like that. So, in a, well, I think there's a realistic chance of, let's say, they start, they you can deduct your mortgage like that, because the higher education is still in there. I calculated how much taxes the grad students would have to pay. Assuming about $25,000 in cycle, $50,000 tuition remission, our taxes go up to almost $11,000 in federal. But that is not in the Senate bill. Right, but the senators saying no to the House bill are saying no for other reasons. Right. There's, that's why this is so difficult to predict. There's a thousand reasons mm -hmm. that each of the individual senator is making decisions based on what their state does, what kind of economy they have, what their constituents need, who's affected by it, who's lobbying them. So that's why it is so difficult to predict what's going to happen and how they're going to make the final decision. And, and as I said in the beginning, every time you change one part of the code, you have to balance that somewhere else, which means that some senator could pull in that particular provision in the House bill to cover something else that somebody else wants a tax break on. And uh, you know, if, if they don't keep that number under 1.5 trillion, and the Senate's having trouble doing that in their version of the bill, mm -hmm. then it would have to go to uh, a broader group of the Senate to vote it through, which actually then means that the Senate would have to work with the Democrats to get it done. And that would be far more difficult. And then I think you'd see a lot more protections for places like higher education. Right, but isn't, isn't there a way, they did before recently voting on something, that they can go down to some majority if they take in some other uh, roundabout way. So in theory, they still could pass it to like 50 people. Yeah, that's even if they, they don't keep it at that 1.5. So then if, my fault, which is, I'm correct on this, if they pass it by December 31st, our taxes filing in April will be, will be taxed on uh, tuition waivers because it's everything that happens by the end of the Year. Well, it depends. Some of the provisions in the Senate bill push it out like a year or more. Right, but that tuition waiver would have to be really. Well, again, it depends on what the final version of the bill says. We don't know yet how that's going to end. So it's going to change a couple of times over the next couple of days. I mean, it's changing as we speak right now. So just trying to keep up with the amendments and the changes is a real challenge. But part of it is that everybody has to get engaged and know that the associations across the country are working. There's thousands, of, literally, probably millions of people at this point working on behalf of higher education, graduate students, undergraduate students, and, uh, and the industry as a whole. Sure. So if the worst case scenario does happen, right, what is this university willing to do? Because a lot of us PhD students, for example, we pay, we are charged tuition and it is remiss, but past the first year we don't take any courses. So it's all just behind the scenes numbers shifting anyways. So is Drexel ready and willing to assist us so we don't pay taxes on money that we don't see and we are essentially working for the university to produce our research like publications? Well, it's right? any, you know, I mean it's a theoretical sure. question, but we're getting yeah. closer to that point, right? Um, I don't know what the financial implications are and what that's going to mean for the institution as a university, so I can't really answer the question. I mean, we're going to have to make some incredibly 
hard decisions. If each and every one of these nine provisions went through, I mean, we're, we're talking about, as I said, it's, it's a sure. tsunami. But so just I just to give you one example, you know one example of his calculation of $11,000 that a student receiving a $25,000 stipend would have to pay, we already have a hard enough uh, pitch with that low stipend in the biology department, for example, to get quality students to come to Drexel. And so the entire higher education system will be crippled by this because yes. we can't afford so to stay in grad school and like school it. Right? The, the, yes. the answer to your question is it's going to be devastating to the higher education industry as a whole. And I think what you would see is um, a very significant um, ramp up of closures of institutions across the country. I mean, that, that would be one of the outcomes. That presents opportunities, but it also presents challenges. And it depends on how well positioned universities are to deal with um, difficult challenges when they hit. So I receive um, tuition remission now as a Drexel staff, and I have to pay very significant taxes on that income. Um, so how would that change? <coughs> you have to pay a little bit more. Even so more the first, I think the first whatever. fifty. Five thousand. Yeah, five thousand two hundred fifty dollars. Right. So you would have to pay taxes on that as well. Okay. So it would go up a little bit. Not you're paying a you're paying a lot, right, over the course yeah. of the year for the whole thing. Because I went through this. So essentially, I I didn't pay taxes in January, February, and March, and I paid taxes throughout the, the the rest of the year, which were rather significant. You'd essentially be paying taxes all twelve months instead of nine. Gotcha. Okay. Um, so I'm an international student, so I'm not very well aware of the American <coughs> system and how the bills passes. And so, like, you know, you read all the news, you know, it says, like, the, the bill passed over the house. Like, I just don't understand, you know, like, what it means, you know? Like, I mean, now you're saying that there's also a bill that needs to pass from Senate. Like, can you, you know, very simply explain, like, you know, do, like, does this house bill passing mean anything at all? Because, like, finally, the, the, the Senate that decides or, you know. <coughs> Does. Do you know how sausage is made? <laughs> kind of. Right. Well, that's it's pretty ugly and messy. And that's sort of what happens um, in Congress. It's trying to get true at the state level and even at the local level. So essentially, the House and the Senate can do things independently of, of each other or together. Right. So in this case, you have a House bill and the Senate has its own bill. And they're similar in many ways because they're working on the very same issue. Um, but there's a lot of components of the bills that are different. So what happens is the House votes on its bill and it puts it forward, which it's done, and now the Senate's going to do the same thing. When they're finished, you're going to have two bills that have to become one bill in the end. And so that's when all the negotiation between the members of Congress occur. And you're going to have a conference committee, which will be made up of some members of the House, the leadership team, some members of the Senate, to be the chair of those committees, like chair of Ways and Means, chair of the Senate Finance Committee and a number of different people that they put onto those committees. So we could end up with Senator, for example, Toomey, or Senator or Congressman Meehan, less likely, on the, on the conference committee that tries to bring those two bills together. And that's where the challenge lies, I think, for the, for the Senate uh, and the Senate Republicans and even the House to get to a place where they can vote on a final bill that they feel comfortable with putting forward to the American public. Uh, because once they make that vote and a bill passes or not, the voters are going to hold them accountable to their decisions. And that's, you know, all of you in this room. So it's a little bit of a messy process, and then they're going to be horse trading between what they want to see in that final bill and who they think they want to help. Um, and that's why it's important for you to get involved. So as far as I understood, for that to, so whatever the House has passed has no effectiveness until not yet. Not yet. I mean, that happens after it kind of gets combined. Right. With the Senate. So just the House version of the bill has passed. Mm -hmm. Now the Senate has to pass a version, then they have to pass a final bill. Okay. And that may not happen. We don't know yet. Okay. So it's course, not late at all. What's that? It's not late at all. Late? late it's in what? It's not too late to keep advocating. Oh, absolutely not. <laughs> no, the goal for them is to get the bill done by the end of the year, around Christmas or before January 1. That's what they're shooting for. That doesn't mean that that will necessarily happen. So I think right. still the last question. Okay. Still going worst case. I think the biggest question that everyone here has.
fact is that, I mean, in theory, you want this bill passed in six weeks. I get to, to get some other signers, I have to take the mortgage um, payments off, right? I trust all the stuff like that, which is up taxing more. So, in theory, they have to get to an education, they have to take the mortgage off, take the um, state and all taxes off, take the property taxes off, and then go to education. It's probably the like, bottom rung of it. But if they get this bill passed in six weeks, in two months, we're going to end up owing $9,000 in federal taxes for next year. Yeah. Is there any, I mean, how, I get that the, you know, the are changing, you also have a plan yet, yeah, but when could we possibly hear a plan? Because so I'm concerned that when I file my taxes, I have to file them early February, that in two months, I'm going to owe $9,000, which I don't have as a graduate student here. So I, I think what I can add to that is just the, the leadership team at Drexel is, I mean, Brian is probably, you know, up 24 hours a day now following this. The president is watching us very carefully. His cabinet is monitoring us very closely. We are on conference calls with other associations listening to what's happening. I think what you can all do right now is take on advocacy at a personal level yourselves to help in you know, trying to change um, this, the particular outcomes of this. But I can tell you that we are working on a daily basis as this evolves to figure out how, as an institution, we are going to be able to respond to this. I can tell you that Drexel, one of Drexel's strategic priorities continues to be graduate education, graduate students drive our research enterprise, that Drexel is very committed to graduate students. So we are on this journey with you, but I need you to know that we are monitoring this very closely and trying to be as proactive as possible in the management of this issue. But as Brian appropriately pointed out, that we can only work with the information that is currently um, available to us and, and it is evolving um, continually. Right, and, and as Elizabeth said, I mean, there's a team of other people who handle you know, finance for the university uh, and what the implications are going to be and the provost and all of the deans uh, and how everyone's particular budgets in their various departments are going to be able to help solve whatever problems come up. Um, the university itself, the president, has been working on putting this university on stable financial footing and working hard on it for the past couple of years. I think we're way ahead of our peers in some of the work that we've been doing. So part of what I talked about earlier is those institutions that have not been doing the work that we've been engaged in, and it's been you know, tough and challenging and painful, uh, are going to really suffer the consequences either with this type of legislation that does impact higher education in very significant ways, uh, or somewhere down the road when we have other economic hip hiccups, which you know inevitably we will have. Um, one thing we can't do is sort of pay those taxes for you. So depending on what happens, is we're going to have to figure out other ways to support students. And um, I don't have the answers to those questions yet, but you've heard the term loophole. Uh, so we'll be looking for loopholes. Uh, if we can find loopholes, believe me, we'll take advantage of them. Just one more question, then we have to go. So, okay, this is a really good What can we do other than just calling our editors and writing our editors? Well, that's the most important thing that you can do. I mean, the, there's an endless list of activities. Uh, you know, I mean, you've, you've heard of people um, marching on Washington, going down to visit them, a personal visit. Doesn't hurt either. You see the articles that are coming out all across the country. Uh, so there was one in, I forget if it was the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times that talked about the House bill um, really doing damage to graduate students. I mean, those kinds of things, believe me, the members of Congress are reading. I mean, these are the folks who are going to make these final decisions. So the more attention and uh, focus that you bring to it, um, the better. Just as one mentioned, um, so if you're in the sciences, even if you're not into the science, um, March for Science is basically the uh, organization that is more or less trying to advocate for science funding and stuff under the current administration. So if you're interested in participating, they have a lot of links on who to contact, how to contact them, what the methods are, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so we will continue this conversation with you. Uh, hopefully, as this evolves, we will be in touch. And thanks for suggesting that. If there are any resources that you need in order to, who do I, you know, what are the talking points? Who should I reach out to? Please reach out to the Graduate College and the GSA. And
presentation, whatever uh, you need. I just want to thank Brian for being here, and we'll continue this conversation.